My name is Sean Overton, and I'm turning this into a desert forest. One of the ways I'm doing that is with check dams. The volunteers have been out here helping me for the last two months, getting those established on about 12 acres, and we've had significant rain since then. So let me show you how that turned out. It was a lot, man. Well, a lot of the comments on the check dams were that we didn't build it properly, which is hardly a surprise because we're all brand new at building check dams. And I think this is a good example of both a win and a failure. It's a win because the check dam's still here. And if you look over here, it's completely full of sediment and organic matter that's caught. But on this side, these rocks were not here. There's no way we left these when they're just absolutely perfect for building these check dams. So the water was strong enough that it did overflow and knock some of the rocks down. But you know what? It's not that big of a deal. We'll just stack them back up and we'll hopefully do it in a better way where we can reinforce that back wall and over time start to make it a little taller. But I think that's a happy failure. All of this silt in here, along with all this organic matter, this is the absolutely perfect way to get life going, is that we build a high quality soil inside of this. Life is likely to sprout and that's just gonna do an even better job of slowing the water down and supporting more life. It's also a core tenant of regenerating an ecosystem is creating islands of fertility. So where you have an unusual concentration of water and high quality soil and opportunity, that's where you concentrate your resources. That's the reason that we've started in this because it's at the top of the watershed where the water is manageable, but there's enough of it to make it interesting. And even some guys like these guys here can come out here with no training, no ecological or biological background, stack some rocks and make a difference. This dirty sand is pretty interesting because that's cyanobacteria and what cyanobacteria do is they form a bio crust and these are great because essentially they have everything they need here just water and because there's not a lot of water it doesn't grow very well but we happen to build this check dam right next to this bio crust and the advantage to doing this is that this is fixing nitrogen in the soil it's one of the like the reason farmers put fertilizer on their crops mostly is nitrogen and this is growing nitrogen straight out of the air. So if we can add more water here, we're just helping them expand and colonize and grow so that they can fix more nitrogen and whatever plants decide to take root here, they'll do even better than they otherwise would have. We wanna make water available where the plants are expecting to find it and where they can drink it in the way they're expecting to drink it. So if we slow rainwater whenever it occurs and then we get it to soak into the soil, you'll have vibrant life pop up. It's not a coincidence that we have more life here in the river bottom because there's more water. And if we add even more water, we're gonna get even more life. I'm just trying to get anything that wants to grow here, I'm happy to have. Cowpeas in particular made the cut because they'll fix nitrogen. And they're the one of the more hardy annuals that'll grow here. Um, is a pretty low probability bet, and these are still really young. We'll see if, if by the end of the season they grow, but the fact that they've even popped up is a good sign. Ideally, I'd like to have a really diverse mix of species. It's gonna depend on the soil conditions too. It's not like you just plant stuff everywhere and expect it to grow. You have specialists that do really well on shallow soils. You have specialists that need really deep soils. And I don't know the exact topography to say, oh, a pomegranate is gonna do really well here. I could, or maybe I can put a jujube over there. I have ideas of things to try, see what grows. And then you get that feedback loop of, okay, I know I want trees and I think trees could do well here. So if I'm able to establish them, that would be amazing. And that is what I prefer, but I'm totally happy failing and only having a, a really healthy stand of native grama grass. If you compare that oxidized grass away from water catchments compared to this, which is right at the base of where all this water is settling, and you have this sediment that's built up behind it, there's still oxidized grass. It hasn't gotten rid of it, but this is getting enough water that it's been able to push out some new growth. This is the greenest grass that I've ever seen on the ranch. This is the central wash behind me. Let's go check out the Gabion and see how well that held up. If you'd like to see all the detailed planning in a Google Earth file, you can get access by joining my Buy Me A Coffee monthly membership. Oh my word. Wow. It completely washed out the bank around the Gabions. Look at the force of that water. That is four gauge steel. 
I mean, I'm bummed that I uh, expanded the channel, but holy cow. Well, the obvious lesson is you cannot rely on the bank to be the edge of the gabion. There must have been an enormous amount of water because this was lower than the bank. So what that means is that the water backed up all the way above the bank and then started eroding around it. We were worried about this area over here. This was a lot more narrow. So quite a bit of the water has pushed through over here. But uh, let's go take a look. What is interesting is, uh, so that's all pure clay. And one is it now has a lining of sediment, but I don't know why that would have slowed it down. Because before last month, this was exposed clay. It didn't have this, is, wow, huh. This was clay last time. How'd I get all this silt here? Not sure what to make of that. Really puts in perspective how powerful the water is in this channel. What's crazy is my little rat nest from a year ago actually did better than this not cheap and labor intensive gabion. Building this literally took me like five minutes and it's still here. And yeah, the water's moved around a little bit and it formed the channel there, but like that backed up and we have all this brush and debris piling up. I just think it's crazy that that is still kind of intact when this is, <laughs> the entire structure has rotated about 30 degrees. So the water just came roaring down here and just overwhelmed it and folded it down. I know that's the case because the entire structure is intact. You can see our wire ties have done their job. They've held the cages together even after they've collapsed. The cages are still here. Now we dug down to the clay and there's zero chance I would have got through that clay by hand. So I think next time, whenever I build a gabion like this, it needs a serious, serious foundation. And also we don't want the wall of water to hit a vertical face. I think it's gonna be important to build ramps up to there so that we can one, just have way more mass than is actually in the gabion. And two, so that when that initial rush of flood water smashes into the wall, that it has a chance to dissipate and overflow and build up material behind it. So I think the future strategy is gonna to be to use a dozer to get under the clay so that we can establish a foundation, build the gabion cages, and then have the dozer come in behind it and push the material either right up next to the gabion or really close so that the full flood water doesn't get a chance to impact it. I'm impressed and disappointed, but uh, it's a step backwards and we'll, uh, we'll keep on going. Really what I'm trying to do here, it's not about agave or prickly pear or grass or cow peas or anything I've talked about. It's really, I just need a foothold. I need something to grow to put organic matter in the soil because if I can slowly accumulate more water and add more organic matter, the plant life will take care of the rest. 